Bo Wilson is a Virginia-based playwright, screenwriter, director, and voice actor. He was born in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and lived all over the Southeast before settling in Richmond, Virginia, just in time to start fourth grade. Richmond has been his home ever since, with time away at Virginia Tech and at the O'Neill Center's National Theater Institute. He makes his living primarily as a writer, creating stage plays and scripts for training films. Among his works are the Charitable Sisterhood Plays and The Boat Right, which won two national awards and premiered at the Grand Rapids Civic Theater of Michigan in 2014 and received its professional premiere at the Firehouse Theater in February 2017. He has written 30 or so titles and has been published by Dramatic Publishing, Samuel French, and Algonquin Press. In 2016, his play The Bookbinder's Tale was a finalist for the prestigious National Playwrights Conference at the O'Neill Theater Center. His new play, Bonnie and Claire, was meant to have its world premiere at Virginia Rep in May 2020, but then came COVID. The Rep remains committed to the piece and plans to premiere it in late 2021. His training film clients include the FBI, DuPont, the U.S. Navy, the Defense Intelligence Analysts, and numerous others, covering topics ranging from workplace safety to cyber warfare to terrorist interdiction. As a director, his productions include True West, Shining City, The Last Days of Judas Iscariot, God of Carnage, and The Beautiful Queen of Lanon, and Angels in America, Millennium Approaches, which received rave reviews and played to sold-out houses at Richmond Triangle Players. Bo is also professional voice talent with several hundred radio and TV ads to his credit for products ranging from Sylvan Learning Centers to Mahatma Rice to the Fallout video game series. Bo's better half is the lovely Jan Guarino, who, along with his children Nora and Zach, add romantic comedy, drama, and surrealism to his life. You can find out more about Bo at his website, bowilson.net. So art entered your life because you were, you, you had seen a play and talk to the actor. That's really how it entered your life? To the best of my understanding, I mean, we could spend hours on the subliminal ways that it might have crept into me. Um, I do think that, that regardless of what I have done, be it playwriting or acting or directing or teaching, that, that the idea of unifying minds, which I think lives at the base of most art, is very active in my in my thinking and i think that language is always a part of what's happening with me uh and so to whatever extent we could say that language is a raw material of art in the way that you know pigment is a raw material of of painting uh if we can make that leap then we could say art has informed my life from the language that could be manipulated and shaped in pleasing or entrancing ways. Uh, so perhaps it's more accurate to say that the utility of language was what drew me into art when I began to realize that language is its own clay, its mm. own pigment. Um, but, but my first experience with artists and with making art was that theater experience. So I wonder, this is a tangent here, but did you ever hear of a book called The Five Love Languages? I have heard of that book. I have not read it, but I know of it. it well, it's since I read it, when it first came out, it's uh, gone on to, there's like five love languages for teenagers, for whatever, that, you know, making cashing in on it. But um, it's a <laughs> franchise. Yeah. But initially it was written by a husband and wife team that uh, were, were both uh, in psychiatry and they had, uh, they were doing a lot of couples counseling and they found that, that this common denominator was that, you know, uh, if they were having trouble, the husband would say, I don't know what the problem is. I'm always, you know, giving her hugs when she's doing the dishes, a little peck on the neck. She's saying, I don't know what his problem is. I'm, I'm always, you know, telling him how handsome he is. And they, what they discovered was that everybody kind of understood that they were loved in a specific way. And there were five right. different ways. Right. So is, there's a words of affirmation, physical touch, acts of service, gifts, and quality time. I am someone who, who I can't really decide on one. I think I'm both words of affirmation and physical touch. I'm a very affectionate person, but I'm, I'm very, um, like, like you, and I guess like a lot of writers, uh, I just understand the power of words. So I'm wondering if that is, uh, if you're aware of your love language and if you are, if it is words of affirmation. I don't think so. Uh, it's possible. I find it, I find it somewhat uh, 
suspicious is one click too harsh of a word. I will always be incredulous when someone is talking to me about themselves because I'd rather talk to their family. You know, I'd rather talk to five friends who can tell me about the person. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I'm not, I don't think I like being praised. I, I enjoy words of affirmation. Um, but I think that doing things together, collaboration, is is probably a more powerful force. The mm -hmm. feeling of of pulling together as a team. Um, on the other hand, I love being the writer and or the director, which allows me to be kind of the boss of the team. So maybe maybe I'm not quite the team player that it sounds like I'm saying. Uh, I I uh, but I enjoy. You know, I, I, I have written a couple of novels, but I'm, I would much rather be in rehearsal. I like people being around and working together and, and discovering things that, oh, I didn't think of that, but that's actually better, you know. I have one best friend who has been my best friend since seventh grade, and we're just twin sons of different mothers. But in terms of other associations, I've always wanted to hang out with, with artists of one stripe or another um, never painters for whatever reason, but musicians, um, uh, other graphic artists, even sculptors, um, actors, they're, they're the only people who seem interesting to me, you know, and, and when I, when I am forced to attend a gathering of civilians, um, it's, it's difficult for me because it's either very quiet, which is not me, or, the topics of conversation, I, I, the only thing that's interesting to me is to sort of sit back and go, why do they think that's interesting? Mm. Um, because, you know, maybe they're ticket buyers. Maybe there's something I can learn <laughs> about what they enjoy. But uh, no, I would, my wife and I have talked about this actually, you know, so many of our friends are, are in show business in one way or another. And it's like, they're, they're the only people that are fun, mm. you know? So that was, its own gravity well in terms of drawing me toward a life, okay? Um, well, you don't get to hang out with those people unless you can contribute something. Uh, now, if you're willing to be sort of, uh, to contribute your time and your ability to Dutchman a flat or whatever, paint, paint scenery, build props, that's how you earn your way in. I'm terrible at all of that stuff, but I could always write. And, uh, and I'm not, it turns out I'm not a bad actor. I thought I was a terrific actor. Then I thought I was a terrible actor. But the bottom line is I'm useful in some ways. If, if the casting is right, I'm very useful. But, uh, but it's, I'm not one of those chameleons who can do anything at the drop of a hat and be amazing. That's not me. Uh, but, but I've always been pretty deft with a pen. And, um, and so that was my ticket to hang out with these cool kids, you know? Um, and, and, I, and I did have an eye for what they were doing. And I would say, you know, I noticed that tonight you were really, you didn't look at her very much. And last night you looked at her a lot. It's better when you don't look at it. Like, oh, really? Okay. Um, you know, and we're all making these discoveries together. None of us know what the hell we're talking about. But, uh, but that, that sense of working on a thing that's alive with people that you value, those, those twinned attractions, uh, hard to beat, very hard to beat. I mean, there's been a number of quotes about this, um, about how strange we are as artists. Uh, like Sarah Jessica Parker talked about moving to Hollywood when she, uh, I think she's from New York, going to Hollywood for the movies, and all of a sudden, because everybody's so screwed up, you feel normal. To me, interested is interesting. And I am sometimes baffled by the lack of curiosity mm. that I see in the world. That is it. And when I, when I see someone who is interested in something, it, it doesn't matter if they're an artist or not. It's just that as a kid, the people whose interests were most clearly on their sleeves were the athletes and the artists. They, they were driven to fight, you know, I knew guys that could do the whole Star Wars franchise for you, word for word. I, I, I am, I am a, a proud flag flying geek of the first order. 
<laughs> I've got so much science fiction and comic books up in my office, you'd die. Um, and we were the trot upon and the outcast for high school. But eventually you find your tribe and that whole process of finding your tribe certainly happened with me and theater. But I began to realize as an adult with my own children that what I was truly drawn to was the passion, which is interest. You know, if you're passionate about something, if you care about it, um, and I don't mean like painting your face and wanting your team to win on Sunday. I suppose that's better than being dead. But what I really like is someone who has lots of questions. I, I had, uh, my daughter had a boyfriend. Um, he's not in the picture anymore. But I remember asking him a question and having him say, well, I don't know. And it was a question about himself. I was asking him about himself. And he said, I don't know. And I, and I tried to prod a little further. Yeah, but don't you think? He's like, I don't really know. And he was utterly disinterested in the question. And I became utterly disinterested in the boy. Because it's like, I can't help you, pal. I'm sure you're going to be fine. I'm sure, you know, you're not different from most of the people in the world, I guess. I don't know. But uh, curiosity is intriguing, whatever its object is. If you want to know why that bird nests in that marsh, I'm with you. If you want to know why that flywheel didn't, didn't have enough force to help the gears shift when they should have, I'm with you. I, I love talking to experts of every stripe. I, and in my training film work, I've had that chance. I've actually gotten to learn lots of weird esoteric stuff from people who are experts in things. And I can tell when I speak to them that they're, I'll tell you a story, Defense, the Defense Intelligence Agency hired me to write some newscasts. And I said, what are you talking about? They said, come to the meeting, we'll explain. They have a training school for military attaches. Military attaches are, are spies that everybody knows are spies. They're not sneaking around like James Bond. They're just listening and taking notes and sending home any observations that seem relevant. Everybody knows that a military attache is gathering intelligence right out there in the open. He's not a sneak, but he is an intelligence source. So they go through this training school where they learn to elicit things at dinner parties and they, you know, all of this stuff. And one of the things they have is this fake nation that, that they pretend to be the attache to for a week. And they needed me to write that nation's newscasts so that the students would learn, okay, that story wasn't important, but that story looked like something we needed to write that down and phone home about. That sounded like it was connected to the political struggles of what, you know, they gave me all the stuff to do. But I'm sitting there and these people were so um, blasé about what they were doing. And I was like, you guys, you run a spy school. That's the coolest thing ever. And they like sit up and they're like, well, I guess it is kind of cool. You know, they had forgotten how cool their job was. So I get to come in all of these different things I've done for, for various government agencies. I get to come in for a couple of weeks and be uh, thrilled at what they're doing and, and learn about it and then forget it if it doesn't stick with me. You know, I'm on to the next thing. But usually the experts aren't used to being valued. Mm. So when I show up and I'm like, God, you know so much about this. This is so cool. They're like, oh, yeah, I guess. It. So, you know, I, I, I always value expertise and I value it even more when it wants to go further. I love research scientists. I, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut. Every kid wanted to be an astronaut. But but it was the team, that whole gang at NASA doing it. I mean, we've had all these TV shows in the last decade that sort of focus on that in a way that I'm kind of happy about because a whole new generation is finding out about they were heroes and being the brains, everything from, you know, uh, oh, Viola Davis, I think. Was yeah, I was, try I was just thinking about that too. Yeah, um, all of these different angles on these stories of people that just wanted to understand a thing, you know, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, the 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 uh, the Enigma 
code machine. Um, what was that movie? Anyway, uh, I love all that stuff. And so all I really care about when I'm talking to somebody else is, are you interested in something? Because if you are, we're going to hit it off. And it's always amazing to me how many people aren't. They're just interested in getting to tomorrow. And, you know, I, I, want, I feel sorry for those folks because they must be up against some tremendous challenges. If tomorrow is enough to hope for, that's, that's a rugged life. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't envy that life. But I, I like the people that are dreaming a little bit. You know, they're the ones that interest me backtracking a little bit so you saw this play and there were subliminal things that got you inspired to be an artist but tell me about the next steps how did how did you eventually become someone who was writing and directing and doing voice work etc i think that i am genetically a storyteller or alternately i am set up in such a way so that because the things that i were mo that i was most passionate about early in life were stories that's what glommed on to me um you know i i i lived in i lived in these a couple of a couple of times growing up i lived in cul-de-sacs where there weren't a lot of kids there weren't there there weren't a lot of playmates but there were books and I, you know, I wasn't very outdoorsy. I'd play in the woods, I'd have fun, but I didn't know how to whittle a canoe or anything like that. Um, so stories got into my DNA really early. And ultimately the commonality of, of the things you just listed are that somehow they are all connected with storytelling. I, I, I feel that I know the voice of a story. And so I can speak in the voice of that story or in many of the voices, you know, I can, I can read a story. I loved reading Harry Potter to my kids because I was all those people. You know, Jim Dale did it a little better, but uh, but I wasn't bad. Why is it, and or how is it that you became a member of Actors, Actors Equity rather than, or as well as, being in SAG? Um, I was liter literary manager at Theater Virginia, which was a Lord Theater here in Richmond. Uh, they went bust in two thousand two. But I was there in 1986 and they wanted to do a summer production. They had never done a summer production before. They did, they did a traditional five show uh, September to May season and they wanted to do a summer show. Their production stage manager had been with the company for 15 years, 16 years. And obviously he was no longer getting equity minimum. He was getting quite a bit more than equity minimum because he had put in his time. Well, equity doesn't allow you, they wanted to do this summer production on a shoestring. They wanted to pay everybody minimum and pray that they would break even. And equity does not allow you to give any equity member a cut in pay during a season. And equity decided that this summer production was part of the preceding season. So if Doug was gonna stage manage it, they, they, they needed him to do it for minimum and he wasn't allowed to do it for minimum. He wasn't allowed to take a pay cut. So the artistic director said to me, do you want to learn to stage manage? And I said, I guess, um, <laughs> uh, what do I have to do? He said, well, I'll walk you through it. He had stage managed probably 30 or 40 shows before he became a director. And so he knew the gig and, uh, he said, you'll have to become a member of equity. And I said, well, I, I don't want to pay initiation for that because I'm not interested in it. And he said, we'll cover that. And I'm sitting here thinking, poor Doug, the money that you just promised to pay my initiation would have covered the difference in the sun. Anyway, um, so I stage managed and I joined Equity as a stage manager. And I, I stage managed uh, almost 70 shows over the years, um, which isn't in my bio because that's a different bio. But um, but that's where I learned a lot about directing. And you learn a lot about playwriting. You're watching the play every night. You learn about acting. You learn, you learn about everything yep. as a stage manager. And the training that I had received at Virginia Tech, which was not acting specific. It, you know, your, your freshman year at Virginia Tech, you had to learn a bunch of stuff that had nothing to do with art. Um, or you didn't think it had much to do with art. 
Uh, and, uh, and so I, I understood how to talk to lighting people. I understood how to talk to costumers. I understood how to make a schedule. I understood budgeting. I, you know, I had all of these things that I was aware of as a function of my training. And yeah, I had to learn to write down staging and the mechanics of calling a show. But that's a rhythm too. And that's a, the rhythm of the story informs the rhythm of how you call a show. And uh, so as long as you learn to give your standbys and your warnings in the correct rhythm, it, it you know, and it's fun. It's like being an air traffic controller. You're up there with your headset. And you, so, uh, so that, that was my entree to equity. That's a long answer to a, to a short question, but. No, that's great. I, oftentimes I, I will find myself picking up whatever gig, like, especially right now, like, sure. I'll take background work on this film, because what else am I doing right now? Right, right, right. But when life was normal, I was, I'm done with the, with the abuse of background work. <laughs> um, but what's interesting is the conversations I would get into with, I mean, this, this applies to any acting venture whatsoever, any, any of the facets of acting. But what's interesting is the people that are new at it, that, are asking for advice. What do you, what should I do? Especially when it comes to screen stuff, because you need to do theater to, to become good at this thing. And a lot of people that get into screen stuff get in initially because they've got like a certain look or something, but they don't actually know how to act. Right. So I'll get some of these guys who they clearly have a great look and they're trying to figure out the acting part. And I tell every single one of them, find a community theater, do anything there because what you just said, when, if, you're, if you're helping to stage manage, if you're assistant stage manager, if you're helping with the ticket booth, you're going to start to, by osmosis, start to pick up some of this stuff and not even realize it. Yeah. But in, in particular, the stage managers, one of the things I've said more than anything to stage managers is, I don't understand why you do what you do, but God bless you for doing it. <laughs> like why would you be this close to the spotlight and say but i just don't want the spotlight and i'll tell you i had i i have had the the acting spotlight wasn't an issue but i cannot tell you how often i was this close to just saying just cross on the earlier line <laughs> i know the director didn't tell you to do it he's gone <laughs> we, have, we have three more weeks of this thing please cross to her on the earlier line. I, I resisted that impulse a thousand times if I resisted it once. Um, and you know, there's a reason why, I don't know if Art Search even exists anymore, but the old newsletter that TCG put out that had all the one ads from all over the country, basically for theater, stage management was always listed in the artistic category. It was never listed on the tech side. It's listed under artistic because you are maintaining the work of the artists. And the small theaters in the world that think of the stage manager as kind of everything. You're the secretary, you're the, you're the, you're the props person, you're the this, you're the, I mean, that is great training, but that's not really the job, not at the professional level. And I loved that I went into the job. I had never even thought about the job until I was working at a Lord theater and my duties were specific and they were relatively narrow compared to the poor stage manager at, you know, Joe and Margaret's uh, auto shop and dinner theater. Um, you know, that, that stage manager is doing everything. He's running the box office. He's locking the place up at night. You know, uh, I, I was permitted to do just that relatively narrow set of functions. And I learned so much about everything. And, and you know, it was a nice gig in the bargain. Your equity minimum was a lot of money to me back then. So my two-pronged question for you then is, with all of this work that you have accomplished, um, what would you say, whether it's something that you knew beforehand or that you've arrived at or that you can look at back in retrospect, what would you say your artistic vision is? And number two, the second part of that is, is what are you aching to, are you, are you aching to write to a specific thing right now? I'm not aching to write a specific thing. If, if I feel, <clears throat> if I have an impulse toward a particular character or collision of characters or a relationship, and I don't instantly know it cold, like, of course, then this, then this, then this. Okay, I'm not going to write that. 
um, if there's something about it that I don't know, that I don't understand, I'll start writing it. I've, I've never, now, will anybody do it? I've, I've got plays that I think are really strong that haven't been produced. Um, so there are productions I ache to see, but if I want to write it, I write it. There's, there's nothing in here that, oh, I wish I could write blah, blah, blah. I'll write it. It's cheap. It's paper and pen. I can do that. Um, my artistic vision, that's, that's a, we, we could easily spend a long time defining that. Sure. I think, I think that, that my vision is bound up in some of Mamet's ideas about action and some of Pinter's ideas about the rhythms of silence and speech. Mm. Um, I, I am quite fond of language as a weapon, language as a tool, not as a means of explaining each other. When I teach playwriting, which I haven't done lately, but I used to do a lot of, I would quote Mamet, who's, I don't know if he said it first, but he's who I read. He said, we do not speak to explain our needs to one another. We speak to achieve our needs from one another. And that difference right there is the difference between 98% of the plays that get written in the world and the 2% that are actually kind of interesting and good. Mm. Um, I was a literary manager. I handled a slush pile for four years. And you know in six pages, if you're in the presence of someone that's writing well or not, and of the I think, I think I read about 500 scripts and I think I recommended eight of them um, because most of them thought that language was a tool for explaining and it's not, it's a tool for getting. So that's, that's probably my, my playwright's vision and my larger artistic vision. I, I'm not sure that I'm confident enough to have one of those. I will tell you that I have a societal vision for art which has to do with everyone trusting that it's important and investing in it and investing in young people and investing in the subsidy of, and I'm not talking about government, give us more money. That's included in what I'm saying, but it, does, it also has to do with how do you imagine the world? Do you imagine a world in which artists matter? In Japan, they have natural living art treasures. Why don't we? Right. You know, so I, I do have thoughts on that, but that's nothing to do with my work. <laughs>